and hundreds of thousands of devices connected uh, using Valena, the open source solution and not. And I would like at the end of this talk actually um, to, to, yeah, to have some, to, to have you sharing some of your experiences of how did you, yeah, what lessons learned did you get if you were helping others or even yourself uh, managing, yeah, IoT or embedded solutions um, into the wild, okay? So, yeah, well, I already introduced myself. Some people call me IoT giant because I'm very tall, I'm 6'9". So, uh, yeah, if you meet me at the next Embedded Linux conference, uh, just let me know, uh, you will meet me. Um, yeah, here are my credentials. If you want to send me an email, um, a tweet, or yeah, mention me, that would be fantastic. Um, so let's start. Probably some people here still don't know what is Valena, right? Maybe it's you, maybe uh, you, you already know it. In case that you don't know what is Valena, um, maybe let me ask you a question. It will be a virtual one, but who knows what it is? Anyone? Yeah, feel free to raise your hand virtually on the chat. Say hello in the chat or me or whatever. So if you, yeah, this is, well, yeah, this is Etcher. Uh, this is Valena Etcher. Uh, this is a software designed to flash SD cards of USB drives uh, and flash uh, Linux uh, operating system images to flash other laptops or IoT devices. If you use Etcher, you already used software made uh, by Valena. What we try to do here is just to reduce maximum the friction of people, developers, and yeah, normal people who are not developers who needed to flash a, an SD card or a USB drive to flash a new operating system on a machine. We try to reduce the friction at maximum, uh, selecting an operating system image, the target uh, device, and then just clicking flash, uh, you would be able. And if you understand this philosophy of reducing friction, this is actually what we like to do at Belena. We like to reduce friction on everything that we do. Okay, like, let me explain what is Belena. If you ever heard this concept of uh, over-the-air updates, or on your mobile phone, you never got an over-the-air update and, and you got an application updated to the newest release or newest version or operating system updates, this is what we do. But we do this just for IoT devices. To do this at Belena, we use containers. We use containers to run all the software on, on the IoT and embedded devices. So what we do basically is to try to reduce the friction of users and developers running software on IoT devices. The only thing that we do is enable people just to update the software running on, on their fleets. Actually, we use Docker and the core functionality of the containers because we understood some years ago that the DevOps, this concept, no, or this new role created, were teaching a lot of uh, new strategies and concepts that were much needed on the IoT and embedded space. We think that most of the autom automatizations that DevOps are creating for managing um, machines and, and servers on the cloud or can be used as well on embedded um, devices. To achieve the mission of reducing the friction to manage the software running on IoT and embedded devices, at Belena we had to build different products. I would like to start with the one on the left, which is uh, Belena OS. Belena OS, it's a Linux operating system for embedded devices, okay? It's an open source Linux based on Yocto. The special thing about Belena OS is, uh, is that it only runs containers. As I mentioned before, we use this Docker and containers core functionalities, so you cannot run anything on the host OS. To run the Docker containers on Belena OS, basically we run another open source project, which is um, Belena Engine. Belen Engine, basically, it's a minimal uh, container engine designed basically for embedded and IoT devices. Since 2013, Belena has been running on, on IoT devices with Docker, but after spending a lot of hours running Docker on, on devices such as Raspberry Pi and uh, Next86, we discovered, yeah, one of the lessons learned that we get there is that we needed to have our own open source container engine based on Mobi project from Docker to have a, a small footprint to improve the bandwidth, et cetera. These are some of the lessons learned I'm gonna share later, but just to explain you know, the context of why we built all of this product. Um, another product that we have, it's Belina Cloud. Belina Cloud 
and Open Belena basically are similar products. Belena Cloud, it's our premium product, enables anyone through a user interface and a dashboard to manage the fleet of devices. You can access remotely to devices, run diagnostics um, from the dashboard, uh, access over SSH to devices and so on. And Open Belena, it's basically the same as Belena Cloud without a um, uh, user interface. Basically, it uses the same API and you can do basically the same operations with Open Belena, with the open source solution than with Belena Cloud. Finally, yeah, I already talked about Belena Etcher and the other product that we have, it's Belena Fin. Belena Fin, it's a hardware. It's a Raspberry Pi carrier board. And actually this is as well the result of a lot of lessons learned. So a lot of customers after trying to grow their fleet of IoT devices uh, using Melena, they discovered that sometimes Raspberry Pi or other type of devices were not uh, good enough uh, or were not industrial grade or industrial proof uh, to, to grow with that. And they were asking for recommendations about hardware. So with all the lessons learned that we get, got from customers, we decided to build our own um, hardware so our customers could grow faster using our own carrier board. So this is why at Belena we have these products as well, based on lessons learned, basically. Uh, something that you as well you have to understand is that at Belena, we are a support-driven company. That means that, first of all, everyone is on support. There is a, a bot that schedules um, some hours of support every week for everyone. Um, and being on support, you have you understand what's happening to the product. You are in contact with with the pains and the frictions of your customers and developers because support as well means to be on the forums with the open source and free customers from Belena. And being a support driven development company, we just create patterns of the symptoms of the frictions and pains that our customers have. And from those patterns, we can decide to build new features solve bugs um, and bring some of these to brainstorm calls to decide what's next on the next version or the next releases of, of Belena. Okay, this is just to explain how internally on a, on a single board computer, how Belena works. I didn't mention that Belena only works on single board computers from ARM devices to x86 or AMD64 devices. And yeah, basically we have a Linux kernel based on Yocto. As I mentioned before, we have a user space where we have the system D and all the networking and so on. We have the Belen engine on the top that manages the containers. And on top of that, we have a container that still it's not, it's hidden, but uh, it's called supervisor. The supervisor basically it's an agent running on a Belena device that it's asking to, to the Belena cloud or to open Belena if there is a new release to deploy on the device. It will download the new release, kill the, the old uh, services and just start the new ones. All the new containers are just next to the supervisor on the top of uh, Belen Engine. I have been talking a lot about maybe fleets and this concept, um, but what do we mean by fleet management? The concept of fleet, it's basically a collection of IoT devices that are running the same uh, software release. We also create the concept of fleet ops or fleet owners based or inspired by, by this concept of the DevOps thing that the fleet owner or the fleet ops should be the, the person or the team who is responsible on building and managing uh, the collection of IoT devices, updating the software running on it. And honestly, deploying new software and new releases on IoT devices in bulk, it's really complex. So let's see an example uh, where probably most of you will recognize yourself or not uh, if you have been developing on embedded devices. But from here, we are gonna start understanding some of the lessons learned that we had at Belena, helping like massive amount of developers to manage a fleet of devices. So most of the projects start with this, with a device like this on top on the top of your table, right? This is a Raspberry Pi. You can start a project with a Raspberry Pi 3 on your table. You have all the cables, all the networking defined, SD card, electricity, and it works fine, right? You can even plug an HDMI cable and get on a, on the display, the logs of your device, you can deploy the uh, flashing your SD card you now with a new version of, of, the of the latest release and, and it works, you can catch uh, bugs and, and so on. But it's, yeah, basically all the projects start like this, they start with a POC or a, or a prototype, but then you get it at this point where if, if you are successful on your project, 
the devices on your table start to grow, right? And you get on this moment where on your table or, or on the lab, you know, Neo 9 Raspberry Pis, and, and you have to make them run the same release, uh, solve bugs and manage all the cables and electricity and networking for all of these 10 devices. It starts to not being that easy to manage all of these devices. And basically, if you discover, yeah, you need to do a new release, how do you do that? If you don't have something that helps you, it's it's really hard. Yeah, and of course you can do it yourself. So just to, but then you are at this point where yeah, you are super successful, and you end up with a with a with a fleet like this. It's an heterogeneous fleet with different types of devices, different architectures, and all of them must run the same uh release or a similar release or the same version how do you do that actually this is something that we are seeing lately i don't know if you are aware we are living on a chip shortage uh, period of time where it's really hard to get some specific components for for hardware and we start to see uh, developers and fleets uh, from customers that are starting to be very heterogeneous. And thanks to the use of Medina OS, which supports almost 100 of different device types from ARM to x86 devices, we start to see developers who can just maintain all of these heterogeneous devices that are from similar device type on the same fleet running the same release at the same time yeah when you don't reinvent the wheel it's it's very interesting to see how uh, solutions that are already on the market can help you a lot to accelerate and just focus on what's important for you and for your project yeah and then you are on this point where you have these 50 devices that i show you on the previous slide but you want to grow to fifty thousand or half a million of these so how would you like to manage the software running on your device, on your embedded devices. Basically, you have two options. You can take the hard way, where yeah, where yeah, you can do it, and you can be successful as as it happens on the movie, right? But yeah, it's hard. It's it's super painful, and yeah, I and mean, what well, yeah, but sometimes you are successful. On the other hand, I like to yeah, I like to show yeah, deploy with Elena and just sit uh, and lean back and relax. Right, um, because yeah, we can help on that. We um, we have experience. We invest a lot of hours. We design all the products that I just showed you before, because we got a lot of lessons learned. We talk with um, thousands of customers and thousands of developers uh, just to after yeah, thirteen years, be able to arrive at this point where you just can deploy just in one click or just using continuous integration, continuous deployment strategies that you can, that you probably use in the cloud. Let's start. So what's, what are the lessons learned that we get just for running nearly 200,000 devices, IOT devices uh, on the same fleet and how we are helping these customers to succeed so they can focus on, on what they do well. So before we get into the lessons learned, I wanted to talk about a, an interesting analogy that I, I really like to explain. It's it's not new, it's from, if I'm not wrong, 2012. It belongs from a DevOps, um, it's a DevOps concept, okay? Which it's the pet versus the cattle analogy. Um, so if we if we go to the pets model basically on the devops point of view they say that uh so the pets if you if you treat the pet the server as a pet so that means that every pet or every server is important they have a name yeah they are unique they are special they are they are you don't have two pets that are exactly the same right even if they are brothers or sisters they they don't they are probably completely different. They behave different or they look completely different, right? Um, in the cattle model, um, the DevOps say that, yeah, the, if you compare the cattle with servers, basically the, the cattle are identical. It's probably they don't have names. They, they are um, identified by numbers or something like that. And yeah, if one gets sick, right, you just can't replace it and get another one that it's identical. This is basically what DevOps do, right? When when one machine that they have on a, an infrastructure on the cloud, yeah, have uh, any problem, they are able to just uh, get down that instance and just get another one that is identical of the previous one, uh, and just some uh, some instructions 
what we learn, one of the lessons learned that we got after yeah, 10 years um, working with IoT uh, on IoT projects and helping companies to succeed, basically it's that the um, developers of IoT and embedded devices ha must treat their IoT devices as pets. So it's very hard uh, to just get an identical device uh, and just deploy it at the same place that it was the other one. Physically speaking, yeah, they are identical. Um, potentially, the the software running on the device is identical. The data, it's completely probably it's completely different. But as well, the problem is just to install the device as well on where it's installed. We have customers with devices in the middle of the ocean or in places where, for example, I was on support and, and there was a customer saying, okay, I have to replace this device because it had a hardware problem. Um, and I have to uh, send someone four days with a donkey just to get that device and just changing for another one. So it's not that simple as the DevOps uh, do. And basically what we learn is that we need to treat all of these IoT devices uh, that belong to a fleet as they are pets because they are hard to replace. It's not easy and, and it's not cheap to replace them. Um, and as well, that means that, yeah, we have to take care when the customers do a new uh, release of the software that needs to get deployed on the embedded devices. We need to take care that it's going to work, that uh, there is a solid uh, strategy to from the supervisor to swap the, the old and the new containers. So yeah, I think this is an important lesson learned that I wanted to share with you that it's very relevant. So let's start um, with the hardware. Okay, this is a, a key component for IoT devices, right? Because you have to have a, like a, a production grade hardware where you are gonna run everything in there. So to have that hardware running uh, with your uh, software releases, you need to ask yourself what are the constraints that you have um, to yeah to to deploy these devices. So where are they going to be installed? We have customers, for example, deploying these on the deserts, in high temperatures, on pet, on oil uh, wells, for example. Or we have other customers uh, installing these with cameras in the North Pole or Antarctica just to study the penguins or polar bears. So yeah, everyone has its its own difference. So yeah, they need they they have different requirements, but it's important to understand where is this going to be installed. That's the same when if we have our device on the table with the over aircon uh, running on the lap. Yeah, it's very hard to to test the environment, but it's super important when you choose the hardware and understand what are going to be the real life constraints or environment where this hardware is going to live uh, when it's going to be deployed in the real wildlife. Okay. How is the power? You, you need the power of our Ethernet. You're going to have solar panels. Uh, yeah, yeah it, this is important. Something that as well we learn, and this is one of the reasons why we built uh, the Raspberry Pi. One, it's a power. Second, for example, it's vibration. So yeah, when you have the, the devices in the industry in some specific places, it vibrates that much that yeah, having an SD card or a specific components like modems, etc., are really hard. Uh, so they, they have problems. So there are actually certifications for vibration. So this is, for example, why on the Blena Fin has some of these certifications uh, in place just to enable these customers or users to use an industrial grade uh, Raspberry Pi with a special uh, power solutions and, for example, and, and has a certification for vibration. Uh, the size is really important and, and yes, well, the price. So the uh, in Internet of Things projects are basically defined by the business model of how much is a, is a device into the market. So yeah, yeah, there are some customers that are using Raspberry Pi Zero because they cannot afford uh, no, a more expensive device that maybe would be better for the use case, but this is the budget that they have. So it's important as well. This is a very important requirement. When you're gonna have, um, when you gotta start a project, understand the business model of, of that project to, to define the price of the hardware. 
second lesson learned it's um, that sometimes it's important to have physical uh, access to the hardware or someone that could have physical access to the hardware because yeah if it's far away in the middle of nowhere uh, yeah and you lose connection to the device yeah you will yeah and you will need first of all yeah to have these di remote diagnostics and remote access to the device but when this is not possible it's important to have this physical access to the device or I i'm going to show you on the next slides um, as well that it's relevant to have um, maybe uh, other devices on the same network to try to run diagnostics um, uh, diagnostic solutions uh, on these devices that are online but they are not connecting to the VPN or to the super or the supervisor it's not connecting and actually sometimes yeah the physical access to the hardware is just to give a power cycle uh, to the device uh, that can solve the problem but yeah in some cases it's not possible so it's a it's a good lesson learned as well we need to understand if the customer has a uh, access to that uh, device or not to take some actions or don't uh, or not. Or, or not taking that actions. Um, then, yeah, chip shortage just created uh, some of the lessons learned is that chip shortage create innovation on the fleet uh, device type definitions. So what we saw is that now fleets uh, start to to get uh, multi device fleets, and being multi device fleets means that yeah, it's uh, you need to have tools to deploy same software on different device types or different architectures. We see now, for example, that yeah, it's very hard to get Raspberry Pis or some type of these single board computers, and it's getting easier to get the Chinese x86 similar solutions as Raspberry Pi. So yeah, how to help and how to enable these developers to run the same um, source code or the same project that they have for ARM devices on x86? This is a success if we can reduce that friction to if we can reduce that friction to, to developers. Okay, time to talk about the memory. And here we have a, a really important uh, lesson learned. Actually, uh, I explained that one of the most popular projects uh, at Belena, it's Belena Etcher. We just created Etcher because uh, we had a lot of lesson learned and, uh, and we saw a lot of friction of IoT developers uh, trying to flash SE cards for, for their projects for, for IoT devices and embedded devices. So we decided to just try to simplify the way of flashing SD cards or USB drives with Etcher. Um, but yeah, another of the lessons learned that we got um, having yeah on on a memory was to try to avoid SD cards when possible. So if you have to start a project, uh, try to run a project that try to run, try to have a hardware that runs on emmcs instead of sd cards sd cards are one of the main problems that most of the uh, single board computers projects uh, have because yeah usually if you go with a really cheap sd card that means that yeah it's going to die at some moment okay we usually suggest uh, an expensive sd card uh, which is Sundays. We don't, we are not being invested by Sundays. We don't get any discount. We we just um, so after millions of hours of running IoT devices and helping customers running IoT devices that this is one of the most reliable SD card. Uh, Sundays Extreme Pro. I have seen personally that yeah, there is uh, depending on the throughput of the read write or the write read data on the SD card, there are other uh, Sundisk. Uh, options but yeah they are same expensive or even more than extreme pro so my recommendation is to spend a lot of money on sd cards if you if this is your only alternative as a memory point of view if not <clears throat> yeah my recommendation would be to run on emmcs um as as it's as we did when we designed the blender fin so as this was one of the lessons learned one of the points of failure of iot devices for with single board computers was the sd card uh, what we decided is that we had to design a single board computer without an SD card. So this is why we add an EMMC on, on the Belina Fin to have a more reliable memory and hard disk uh, running on, on that hardware. 
Okay, time to talk about connectivity. Connectivity, it's, it's really interesting because sometimes it's, it's important to understand how devices are connected uh, to the internet uh, and if they are going to have enough bandwidth. Yeah, before I, I, I invest some time talking about Belen Engine, why we created our own uh, container engine, right? And one of the main reasons was uh, were all the lessons learned that we got on, on connectivity and different types of connectivity for embedded devices. Basically, one of the patterns that we saw was that, and, and was started by a company who was trying to connect uh, embedded devices in the middle of the jungle where there were no connectivity. And they had to release new uh, updates using satellite communication on these devices in the middle of the jungle. And then, yeah, I, I'm not sure how many megs or gigs was that, but yeah, now I'm playing with some IoT edge uh, machine learning uh, projects where, yeah, the, 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 the service running, the machine learning model, it's about two gigs, three, five gigs, depending on how big is the machine learning model. So uh, you need a lot of libraries as well to run that, etc. cetera. So um, yeah, uh, do you want, if you are on cellular connectivity, do you want to release, release uh, or deploy the latest release on on cellular connectivity of that machine learning container? Or if you are in, in the middle of the jungle with satellite communication, which is super expensive, what, uh, what do you want to do? So this is why um, we develop the deltas on Balin Engine. So having the possibilities of having our own container engine based on Docker Mobi, uh, we just enable the deltas. And basically the deltas, what it does, it's for every layer on the Docker um, description on the Docker file, or um, basically we extract the difference between the layers and we only just uh, send the differences between layers to the devices. And, and that's important because that reduces the footprint of the, of the newest release from 10 to 70 times. So yeah, in this case, yeah, if you wanted to change something small for this satellite communication, yeah, you're gonna spend less and less time. Having said that, uh, yeah, we have more lessons learned here. Even if, if uh, you use deltas, there are now new communications with a 5G connectivity, like LTEM uh, CAD1, for example, which, yeah, you get like 200 kilobits per second. Um, so yeah, if you want to even uh, download 100 megs, um, because this is the delta from your newest release, uh, yeah, it will take some time, all right? Uh, I was speaking with a, with a developer from the community who was running a cellular connectivity of 64 kilobit per second. So, and yeah, so we, yeah, we tried to help with the deltas to, to enable them to use any type of connectivity but as well, it's it's important to understand that yeah, if you if you do your own solution, yeah, it's relevant to know how is is this going to be connected. Be, are you going to have enough um, bandwidth? Um, something interesting is that sometimes it's important to have a backup connectivity. So um, with Network Manager, you can define which connectivity has more priority or not. Um, so it's important to see if something fails, you have a B plan for connectivity point of view. Um, but yeah, I, I have been working lately with another community or another project called Blues Wireless, which it's not just for, a, it doesn't work for updating the software because it's this new types of connectivity that gives you 500 max during 10 years. But it's important to use it, for example, as a backup connectivity, if the device gets offline or gets online with these VPN problems. You can send the logs or diagnostics with this backup connectivity. So I start to see more and more, depending on the on the projects, if they are if it's important to have a reliable connected device, that there is a B plan on the connectivity point of view. And finally, just to um, and this is some a lesson learned that uh, we got from industrial IoT devices is that sometimes the VPN on, on industries is killing the, the Valena VPN to access. So the supervisor cannot uh, use the VPN uh, to access to the device. So we cannot access to the diagnostics or the logs of the device. And it's really hard to understand what is happening to that device. So 
having another device connected to the same network of of the um, of the fleet or or just a device from that fleet can help us to do um, remote diagnostic access um, just because it's on the same network. So we, we have been having seen the, the friction and the pains that we have seen from a lot of customers. One of the lessons learned is it's to build uh, a project, uh, which is a container that if you deploy that container, a Docker container on a device that it's running on the same network and your device that it's online, but we can have access to the VPN or over HTTP, uh, can get all the diagnostics and we can understand what, what's going on with that device. And finally, let's, uh, let's talk about the software. Okay, this is one of the most relevant for me and where we got more lessons learned, actually, if you want to have an IoT fleet that grows a lot. So first of all, you must have remote access to your devices. Okay, it's important. It's important to get the logs. It's important to understand what's happening in real time. Even if you want to do some monitoring, understand the CPU, memory, and so on. But this is one of the lessons learned that we get. Uh, understanding, for example, that the devices have enough memory and uh, they will be able to yeah re get deploy the latest release of the software uh, that it's ready to be deployed or uh, yeah um, just having this remote access gives a lot of information uh, that it's very important second of the lessons learned is that yeah it's to help customers to succeed on, on embedded devices and IoT projects, it's to enable them to run diagnostics remotely. So running diagnostics um, basically allows uh, anyone to see what's happening in real time. So we run some basic diagnostics on devices in the edge run by the supervisor where it, it let us know if there is a problem on the SD card or there is the device is under voltage or what type of errors it's, or that container it's restarting all the time. So just ask, uh, um, being available to remotely um, run some diagnostics on the device can help you a lot on growing your project. Because yeah, if you are completely blind and you don't understand why some of the devices work and some of the other devices don't work, it's really hard to find the patterns um, to grow. And yeah. And one of them for for me, one of the most important lessons learned uh, that you have to do if you are on this embedded um, devices wall and you want to, yeah, have a project that that grows and it's stable and it's solid, it's that you have to enable uh, to do remote updates. Um, and and here, yeah. So I, I think I already mentioned that, but some of our biggest competitor it's the it's a do it yourself right but sometimes i speak with developers that are doing this themselves and i ask them okay so do you update the application code from from your project yes of course yeah we do we use that this this and that uh, and we can do it that's super simple that was a weekend of work oh fantastic yeah sure <laughs> and uh, yeah what about the operating system do you update the operating system Oh no! Why? Uh, why do you need to update the operating system? Oh come on! Uh, so this is super relevant as well, and sometimes people don't take attention on that. So <laughs> imagine this this concept, right? A startup uh, launching an IoT device, super successful, and they do not uh, they are, are they, and they are able to update, of course, the application source code in case that there is a bug, etc but they are not able to update the operating system remotely. So what's the solution here? So you, in five years, you're going to have a big fleet of IoT devices uh, deployed all around the world and running a still the same um, the same open operating system that used to be yeah, trendy like five years ago. And all, all the tooling that needed to run that or to manage that operating system, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, um, actually, as I said before, we think that all the DevOps strategies and tools that they have, we need to bring them back to the, uh, with all the DevOps tools and strategies that they have, we need to bring them into the IoT and embedded wall because we think that, yeah, this is the way that we need to go. It's, 
it's okay, it's over. We need to say it's over the time that embedded developers are using like 20, 20th century tools. We are on 21st century and we need to start uh, using 21st century tools such as containers and this type of technology. And we need to start to think on how to automatize um, this type of projects and, and stop. Yeah, I remember working on embedded projects where yeah, developer needed to run Windows 98, right? Because it was the only operating system version where something uh, or, dri or some drivers needed to run. Uh, yeah, we need to get uh, over about this uh, story. Another lesson learned that it's important, it's we need more test environments, okay? Same as I explained before. <laughs> DevOps and engine, software engineers, they do have test environments. IoT and embedded devices, they need the same. They need the same techniques and the same strategy because and this is software, right? We need to add continuous integration, continuous deployment strategies as well into the embedded world, okay? Uh, yeah, it's it's the right time to do it, and, and there are already tools that are enabling uh, or are helping from that. I think, and of course, test environments. We help our customers. We have different strategies basically for that, but we strongly recommend to have a fleet of uh, for tests where the devices are, are as well in into the wild, but they belong to the test, and when it works properly <laughs> into the test environment. This deploy can be this release. Sorry, can be deployed on the on the production uh, environment. And finally, uh, and this is as well a lesson learned that we got from big uh, fleets of IoT devices, is that we recommend uh, when you have a big fleet to pre-schedule the update of that fleet. Why? Uh, this is a very good question, but sometimes uh, infrastructure not only depends about you, but it depends about yeah, worldwide connectivity, uh, infrastructure, and so on and so on. So what we try to do as well, pretty scheduling updates, is that um, yeah, we can ensure that almost everything it might work at that moment. If we are not aware of an update of a new release uh, that needs to be deployed in a big fleet, yeah. It usually works, 99% uh, of times work, but sometimes can, maybe might not work. So it's important. <laughs> we have seen customers doing <laughs> releases on Sundays and etc. So yeah. Yeah, so we got some lessons learned from these four categories, right? Hardware, memory, activity, and software. I'm sure that you have other stories. So I would like to hear in just one minute, uh, your stories about um, your lessons learned, but let me wrap up in one minute what I was talking today. Um, I think most of the things I wanted to, as a wrap up or as a conclusion of, the, of my talk was, yeah, if you want to, some of the lessons learned that we got uh, helping thousands of customers and uh, IoT developers and embedded developers, at least from all of my experience, uh, I always say, don't reinvent the wheel. So yeah, the, and focus on what you are good at or or, the, or what is important on your use case or your product and stop reinventing the wheel. Because yeah, sometimes for engineers, it's funny. And it's, uh, it, yeah, we love to reinvent uh, and re-engineer things. But yeah, if it, if it works and it exists, just don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, if it is said to don't reinvent the wheel, my suggestion is work with great partners, w work with partners who provide great support as well. And when you need to select hardware, please, please select production grade hardware. Uh, the best SD cards, the most, ex not the most expensive, but yeah, the best SD cards that you can find, like the Sandisk Extreme Pro or similar. And finally, when you do a project uh, from an embedded device, my recommendation, it's to get a B plan because sometimes things doesn't work. I hate the locking strategies from some of the platforms that are available nowadays into the market. So my recommendation is get a B plan or maybe your A plan as well contemplates uh, the embracing open source. So uh, I show you know, Plena offers the full stack for managing uh, and the deploys of, of so, and software updates, uh, the complete stack is open source. 
So I think this is a great solution because yeah, you are going to be able to just manage your solution yourself in case that something happens to that company and you know, and your customers are not going to have a break uh, at all. Thank you very much. And I hope that you enjoyed the Better Linux conference as I am doing. Have a good day. Let's talk now on the chat. I'm, I'm just on the chat. See you. Bye.